Good day, Roger. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. This is gonna be our third video. The first one we did way back in 2008, and the second one we did way back in 2009. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for our audience, uh, would you please introduce yourself, and let's start off by doing it this way. Um, uh, give us your name and tell us where you grew up. Well, my name is Roger Addison, and I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, that, will, that will unfold the story because it has an interesting uh, relationship of why Albuquerque. Okay, yes. I know a little bit about this story. So where did you go off to college, and what did you study in college? Well, um, this is sort of a twofold question. Uh, I got my formal education. Uh, I went to Eastern New Mexico University, which was in Port Tallis, which was, uh, I, I loved it there. I mean, it's, it's just sort of, I, I just, I found out that I loved education when I went to, off to university. Before that, I wasn't quite kept on education. But then uh, after that, I did my uh, graduate work at Baylor University. And I'll tell you part of the story too, how I got the Baylor, because that's an interesting story. I think it's an interesting story. Very good. So, but uh, again, my, but my, that was my formal education, but I have the, I think a, a extensive informal education is where I learned my profession. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get to that here in just a second. So where, where are you now? Where do you live and, and work? I am now in Sausalito, California which is in Northern California. So just think of San Francisco, you cross the Golden Gate Bridge and the first turnoff you get to is South Salito. So that's where I live now. And I currently do consulting work. Um, well, I don't do much consulting work right now because of the pandemic, <laughs> I'm in my house, but uh, I do consulting work all over the world. All right, so thank you for that. Uh, let's, uh, let's go back into the early days here and some of the more interesting things that you've been involved with uh, and worked on in your career. So let's go back to the, those early days back, I guess, in Albuquerque. Well, I had moved to Albuquerque with uh, my family and that was in the 1950s. And so Albuquerque was really a small, real small town. And it was, a, it was a military town, basically. And so I moved there with my mom and dad, and I happened to be with my brother. And some of you probably don't know my brother is Don Toasty. So he was attending, he was going to attend the University of New Mexico, which he did. So uh, as I got a little older and in high school, my brother happened to start working for an organization called Teaching Machines Incorporated. And that was started by Lloyd Hami, Dr. Lloyd Hami, and Dr. Jim Evans. And both of them had been working with Skinner at the laboratory on programmed instruction. And TMI, Teaching Machines Incorporated, is one of the first companies that was, had developed uh, programmed instruction. And they were taken over by an organization called Brolier, which is the encyclopedia company. And they actually sold these machines and these programs door to door as part of their Part of the, what they did. So what they were doing is that they were looking for subjects, because that's what they called us. They called us, they were psychologists, so they called us subjects. They were looking for subjects to come in and test these program instruction. So my brother says, well, I got a, I have a brother. <laughs> He'll come in, and they paid me 50 cents an hour to go through the program instruction. And then, uh, so I was used to, to test the first programs from earlier. So actually, if you, if you think about TMI, which is interesting, it was an interesting place because they were all psychologists. So actually in the building, they had a, a rat lab and pigeon lab. So they basically ran their organization as a, a, learning, a, learning, organization, a learning lab. And so that's how I sort of got into the mix of, I, I just thought, I thought that's the way everything was because how I was like still in high school basically at that time. So then I started, they needed somebody to work in their learning lab to sort of take all the materials that had been run other students. And, they, and so I then 
went through all of the materials and circled all of the wrong or the right answers. So then the programmers, did, that was the analysis. So the programmers come in and say, what did they do? It, it, and so which, which of the should they change? So I got pretty good at looking at lots and lots and lots and lots of programs. And I said, I could write one of those. <laughs> By the way, remember, I'm still in high school. Yeah. I said, I could write one of those. So they said, well, go ahead and try and see. So I, I did, and they published one of, the, one of the first ones was spelling, which is not my forte, frankly. But I did, know, I did figure out how to sort of lay out step by step. So like my education was actually on the job. So that was my first one. Now, TMI was an interesting place too, because a lot of people knew Lloyd Hummey because he was quite famous in the first parts of program instruction. So you had a lot and lots of visitors. So uh, Bob Mager would come to visit, Joe Harless would come. So people would come to visit to see what was going on in this new profession. So I, so I met a lot of people, but I had no idea, frankly, who I was meeting. But I, I mean, I tell one story. Um, they liked, uh, they, they bought a unicycle company. And I remember that uh, we all learned a unicycle. And that's uh, one of the things I remember about Bob Mager was basically riding unicycles. So that's how I, so I met. So I met a lot of people that way uh, along the way. Now, one of the things, um, so, so, so I say that's why I sort of got my education is by just, I, I, don't, I don't know how it happened. But people, I just kept saying, yes, I think I could do that. And people said, well, go ahead and try it. And Lloyd Homme was quite an interesting character uh, on that, uh, which I, I, I learned a lot from. I learned a lot from all of them. I mean, it was, it was a great place to, to grow up. Uh, eventually, TMI was, uh, went out of business, or they all sort of moved over to Westinghouse Learning Corporation. And that was one of the first things that they had another laboratory there and they needed somebody to, to, to manage their laboratory. So I said, I can do that. <laughs> so, so then I started working on managing their laboratory for them and they had students come in after school. And so we set up a, a program uh, to help students that needed more education. And then, so there, so it was, it was really interesting uh, to learn about, you know, on the job of how people learn. I didn't take any learning courses, but by the way, I was not, I had never went to college before that. These were all before I went to college. These were just doing some of these things. The other thing too is really interesting. I met a gentleman, which I'll bring up later on. His name was Lou Bright. And Dr. Lou Bright was, he started the uh, laboratories or Westinghouse Learning Corporation. He later became associate commissioner of education. Uh, for the United States. And so it was a really interesting for me to get into that whole area. So then they needed <laughs> somebody, they, they opened, started opening job course centers. And Westinghouse had a job course center. And one of the, there was a special project in Washington, D.C. Um, that they had established and they were gonna bring in uh, various people from all the job course centers to see sort of representatives and they needed somebody to go in and set up their learning lab. Well, they didn't call it a learning lab, but their educational system. And I had but I'd gotten pretty good about doing that uh, along the way. So I said, I can do that. So they sent me to Washington DC to pick up, the, and this was amazing, to become the director of training for, yeah, I know. I, I look back at it and I just say it's amazing. Uh, the, so a person, Ansi Debaca and I went to, to set up the, the classrooms for the Job Corps Center. And we met, uh, we had 50 students and uh, we did that for, so actually it turned out, we did that for a long time actually. So, so I just learned along the way of this whole thing about programmed instruction, about online, actually, Online learning was sort of, we already had done that, some of the things like that. So that was nothing new for us. Um, there we go. But then here's what happened. I was talking to the people who were running the Job Corps Center, and I was, I don't know how I found out, but I was looking at people, they made more money than me, other people. And I said, how come all these people are making more money than I am? I, I'm, doing this, I'm doing the same work. And they said to me, 
well, you don't have an education. So I said, well, I can solve that problem. So I basically quit my job, or quit it, went to, and that's when I started at Eastern New Mexico University and started working on my education. And I didn't stop, well, I got my education. I graduated from Eastern. I had a phone call before commencement saying, would you like to have a job at Baylor University? And that was Lou Bright. So connections, all these connections, that was Lou Bright. So Lou Bright uh, had set up the Western Institute for Science and Technology at Baylor University. And uh, what they had was at that time, the largest computer in the world, educational computer in the world, that was at Baylor University. And they had uh, extension, and it was a big funding from the, from the government. So it was really interesting. So I, that was the first program, that was the first online program, things that I was initiated to. And we had, you know, laser printers, we had portable printers, we had everything imaginable. And I just thought that's the way it was <laughs> because we just happened to be at the right time at the right place. So I did projects for Lou Bright. Um, and then this, and, and a lot of those things come up, would come up with upper bound projects. And upper bound was one of the um, programs that was started by the Great Society. And I got pretty good at establishing those. And so I did that also during this time. So that was my, my summer work and my winter work and coming up with different things. Um, so then I got, so I said, well, I'm here at Baylor University. Why don't I start taking some classes? So I started taking some classes and I just, you take one class and you take another class and lo and behold, you have a master's degree. And then, and then they said, actually the department said, you know, would you like to be a graduate student? Which I, so I said, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, not only that, they'll pay for it. So I got a, so I had a scholarship for, as a graduate student at Baylor University. So my degree was in actually educational psychology from Baylor University for both my master's and my doctorate. That was in the 1970s. That was the, sort of the 70s, my 70s period. I, I graduated from Baylor. Um, then I said, well, maybe I need to get a real job. So I said, um, and so I go back to Roy Tommy and Don Tosti had set up a place called Operants. Doesn't that sound very Skinnerian? <laughs> Operants. And I started working for Operants. And that's where I met Bob, Bob Carlton and Bill Daniels and Stephanie Jackson. And I, I worked with them for a while. Um, they were later on, they were purchased by the Forum Corporation. Forum Corporation decided that they didn't be in my service anymore. And then I met, I knew Margot Murray before that, way before that. But Margot found out that I was leaving operants and said, well, I, the people at Wells Fargo are looking for people with performance, performance, actually we call it performance improvement background. And she said, would you like to interview? And I said, sure, that's, a, I need a job. So yes, I'll interview. So I went to work for Wells Fargo as uh, one of their internal consultants. And that's where I met Carol Haig, that she and I started at the same day. And then Kearney did a lot of work for us also, which is part of another story as you probably could see now. I worked for Wells Fargo for uh, like 19 years. I started as one of the performance consultants and then eventually uh, took over the department and again, we ran a performance improvement group for like uh, over 19 years. And, I had, and, and during that time too, which was really interesting, for at least as interesting to me, I brought in a lot of consultants to work with me. Uh, so Harold Stolovich, you know, came in and did some work for me. Uh, I had Don come in and do some work for me. I, I could choose people because it was a consulting group and they, we had no buddy. So we had all these people we could hire to work with this. And then Lynn Kearney was also one, one of the people that I worked with and well, she did graphic facilitation for us. And, you know, I, again, I was like, and I, I, I sort of like, I look back and I saw, it was another learning lab I set up at Wells Fargo. And that's when Wells Fargo was a great place to work. Well, I don't know about now, but it certainly was, it was back then. They let us experiment and do lots of different things. Uh, it was exciting. Um, eventually I left Wells Fargo 
uh, went to work for ISBI uh, to be there, um, looked at their performance improvement, basically, and they're the person to see how all this worked. We also established the institutes. Um, the institutes uh, was one of my thinking. I said, I have to, I don't want anybody, I want people to work in the institutes that were actually the practitioners. So uh, I got a group of people together. Yuri Rumler was one of them. And uh, we met it uh, after one of the conferences and a group of us sat down and designed the first institute. And we gave the first institutes and then from then on, uh, we had a, a faculty of people that were um, people that you know that actually were all past presidents of ISPI worked in the institutes in the first part of the, when we rolled them out. So that's- When did you, when did you start those institutes? Approximately what year? Well, uh, Ruth Clark was president. So, so you had to go back a long ways. Yeah. So, so I mean, uh, and th th that was an interesting story too, is that th there was a group of people who were really concerned that ISPI was gonna compete with, with them by establishing a, an institute. Mm -hmm. And so there was a big meeting of past presidents and there was a group that said that, um, well, maybe we shouldn't do it because we'll compete. And then the group says, no, 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 I'll bring in more business for all of us if we get our name out there. Because as you know, ISBI always says, is and always remain the best kept secret in uh, the world. <laughs> so uh, we, 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 we came up and they all agreed finally, well, okay, we can do one to see how it will work. And I said, great, let's make sure the faculty is made up of you past presidents. So, so how are they going to turn me down? <laughs> that was the idea. So anyway, they were the past, and it was another great learning experience because I got to sit with them and be part of their information flow. And it was just, it was another one of this really great, great experience. And again, it was really fun for me to work for ISPI for about 10 years as well. Then I left ISPI and started doing more consulting work. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's sort of, that's my education. Yes. Well, well, let's go back a little bit to talk about, so I know that you don't call it HPT, Human Performance Technology, and the society over the decades has struggled with what to call this thing. It's, a, it's sometimes called instruction and non-instruction. Of course, that non-instruction is a, is a, a, a large uh, set of interventions, etc. cetera. But um, so when did you... So, so yes, when you were doing program instruction and then that kind of morphed into performance improvement, what was your real first exposure? What, you know, when was the aha and uh, who do you, would you attribute you know, your, your initial learnings about performance improvement beyond instruction? Well, I think you have to go back to the learning labs at Westinghouse Learning Corporation because they didn't talk about HPT. Although, as you remember too, Lloyd Homme and Tom Gilbert were very good friends. And Jim Evans was actually Tom Gilbert's best friend. Um, so, I mean, so I mean, I sort of had that mm -hmm. mix in going for him, but that's a, a whole nother story. Yeah. <laughs> but, but again, but I, that's when I started, you know, we, we can call it HPT, that it wasn't even, even mentioned. We were there to improve performance. And again, performance of people, I'm not suggesting we didn't, but, I sort of when it really changed for me is when I took a Praxis course. Uh, and that's when I started seeing that it was a quite a different way of thinking about this. You know, I, I was sort of prepped for it. Uh, Lloyd Homme practiced for it. So thinking that it wasn't this, just the people side, it was the, the processes, but we didn't call it exactly that. And it was sort of, certainly the environment. We did think the environment was extremely important. So uh, for those I people who don't know, thing, thinking about it, but those for those people who don't know about Praxis, that was the business, the consulting business of Tom Gilbert and Gary Rumler, right, yeah, right. and that started sometime in the mid to late '60s. Is that fair to say? Right, but I didn't actually take a course until uh, in the '70s. Okay. With, so, and actually, I still, if you look on my bookshelf behind me, yeah. I still have my practice materials. Uh, 
behind me. And every once in a while, you know, I'll bring it out because the case studies are all good and everything. I mean, the jaw baits and everything are still, you know, you still use them today. So that was, mm-hmm. that's always been. I, I keep everything too, but sometimes it's, that's a, a downside sometimes for people, at least for not for me, but some people. So, exactly. so therefore, I just, and by the way, you know, I was always, it was always curious to me is that it's the International Society for Performance Improvement. Performance Improvement. Mm-hmm. We're not the International Society for HPT. So I, so I always was confusing to me why HPT became something that we're not. At least that's my, was my thinking. So then along comes the, which was probably crazy, um, the, the HPT model. Yes. And, and it's, it's all the HPT model, mm-hmm. which I wouldn't mind it if they call it a HPP model. Right. We call it the. So, so that is attributable to uh, Bill Dederlein and Mark Rosenberg, as I understand it. Oh, uh, yeah. And actually, if you look at it, they came up, they wanted to do some case studies. And so they basically came up this model to, to design the case studies around this model. So mm-hmm. Bill Dederlein and Mark Rosenberg. Uh, actually, and it's actually, if you go to the Treasure w- w- website, you'll see the actual, I think the original model and also see their, um, uh, their, their publication. And so there yeah. were seven of us and I, and uh, uh, we had a case study in there uh, that we used for, for, from Wells Fargo. Mm-hmm. So that was how I got sort of interested in a model, not the model. Yeah, right. It's morphed into the model right now. But, and if you look at it, if you look at the work that the Boise State has done on their spiral, they call it the spiral model, mm-hmm. it's even better than people call it the HPT model. But I mean, it's really, a lot, I think it's, it's a lot better design. And that's just, again, my opinion. If you want, the, if you want to go that model. Yeah. Also, while I was working for ISBI, um, ISBI used to be model driven, which was another thing that I never quite understood because there were so many models who, and who cared. And, and basically the models was, you know, Harless would say, well, my model is better than their model. And, but, but they were just, everybody's model was the same. Yeah. Basically. So we, we had a summit of all the people who had different models. And I said, can somebody give me an agreement on what you all agree on what performance improvement is? And that's where the, um, the RSVP came out. Mm-hmm. And then Explain all, that. The, Explain that to the everybody. RSVP was, it said, they all agreed that they focused on results. They all agreed that they took a systemic or systems viewpoint. They all said we had to add value in some way. And usually we have metrics that say we add the value, we could prove what we said. And then the other thing was, there were partners and they all agreed that, that we can't do this alone. You guys have at least our clients. Plus there are a lot of other people in the same business. So we partner with them. So that became the sort of the, we all agree on this. And then they all said, we have a systematic approach from analysis to implementation. And the ones you see on the website is what they sort of agreed with. Mm-hmm. But, but other thing, you know, somebody had three, three steps, somebody had 12 steps, but they all were, from analysis to implementation. Yeah, and they're all just variations on the same thing. It's just been the okay. continuous fight. That, that when I first got exposed to all of this in the very late 1979 and through the 80s, that was that made it difficult for new people coming in because you you it took you a while to figure out. Wait a minute, this is the same thing. It's, it's just the same thing a little bit differently. It's just labeled a little bit differently. Uh, we talk about HPT. We talk about performance improvement. We talk about we. We have so many different um, labels. Our language is so messy. I, and I remember Joe Harless complaining about the language back in the mid eighties. He wished that we would all kind of you know, get down to one. But that was the problem that all of these people competed against each other and they didn't want to embrace somebody else's model. And that led to a lot of the, uh, I don't know if it was infighting, it was friendly competition because they, I remember Harless telling me and Rumler telling me back in the day that 
that uh, they competed against each other, but then they also partnered with each other on big projects. Well, that was the interesting. A little bit about each other. Yeah, I think that was interesting about when they would come to ISBI, they would give their papers and their discussions, and then the, the learning took place after hours in the bar, where yeah. they started talking about where they started talking about all the things that they were actually doing, and they started talking about sharing their information. Now, they wouldn't share all the deep, dark secrets, I don't think, because they kind of held back. But they, what was always interesting was ISBI was a very, very sharing uh, organization. And again, yeah. I learned a lot from people but just, just that way. Yeah, that, no, that was so true. I think that that's, uh, that's kind of what's driven me to collect things from other people and share them because that was my experience kind of growing up in the profession was I, I leveraged everything that I learned at conferences and, and less so in the publications because the conferences were the, where you really got the meat and at the bar. And you took to the very first meeting of what became the Tucson Seven. Uh, <laughs> And well, uh, you, I, know. Uh, I think me and Tim Eskew, if I remember correctly, you brought the two of us to this right. very first sit down meeting. Right. And these guys were getting kind of grumpy because they felt that the society wasn't really meeting their needs. Everything right. kind of aimed at, you know, beginners, maybe intermediate, but there was less for the advanced group. But can you tell us a little bit about, you know, that, that Tucson Seven group from your perspective? Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, it, was a, it was a group of people, there were seven of them that met. And what they decided to do after all these years is why don't we sit down and talk about our models? So they went to Gary Rumler's house in Tucson and they started sharing some of their information. And um, I was not invited, which was okay. But, but what, was, what was nice about it, the people that I knew that were invited was Don Toasty. So guess what? I get to hear about the Tucson 7 meeting from another source. And then Gary Rummer, Gary Rummer and I had by then had some quite a, a good friendship. So I called Gary up and asked him what's happening with the Tucson 7. So I, I got a lot of information where I didn't have to sit there, which would have been interesting to do. But at the same time, I got a lot of, of, of information out of the two of them of, of what the what the Tucson Seven was talking about. And then also Roger Coughlin would share stuff with me too. Yes. So, yeah. so I remember we were, you and I and Tim Eskew were actually invited to the first meeting and then a couple of weeks later we were disinvited. Disinvited. Right. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's the way life goes. They miss out on all of our wonderful insights. <laughs> I would have been taking copious notes through the whole thing. Um, all right, so, well, thank you. And that's, you have a long storied history and you've met a lot of the people that I only know by name and people that I don't even know by name. Well, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of people too that I, you know, didn't even mention that were just basically pioneers in the field. Um, you know, I mentioned Lou Bright, which I, he, he just basically, he supported all this with funding. Mm -hmm. So, and being the Social Commission of Education, uh, being with Job Corps, I mean, he did a lot of funding on this because he believed in this so much. Well, who so, asked, um, what else would you mention? So to, well, uh, you know, uh, kind of give them credit. Well, another person, another person was George Geis. Yes. Uh, and George Geis was a part of that whole uh, Michigan group and worked Michigan on, Mafia. Yeah, the Michigan. So I, I learned a lot from him. Actually, when I was president, I asked him to be one of the speakers, as well as Joe Harless was being a speaker at my conference, or I say my conference, not that conference. Yeah. Um, he was the was, Joe was the wizard. Of wizard. New <laughs> we have that on video, and it's a pretty yeah, so lousy would, video, but it's funny. He wouldn't tell me what he was going to do either. I had no idea. I had no idea. Uh, so I mean, he ma he made sure though in my introduction that he. You know, he gave me exactly what I was supposed, of course, Joe would do that. So mm. what I was supposed to say to introduce him. So basically, and then he came on and again, no one knew what he was. And that, I think you got that on the treasurer's site, or at least part mm. of it on the treasurer's yeah. site, which is very interesting. The other person that was another one, a character along the way, his name was Charlie Slack. I don't know if you ever heard of Charlie Slack, but Charlie Slack had some really interesting projects that I happened to get to work with. And so that was another person who was sort of a, a pioneer in the field. Sorry about that. 
So, so that was just another one of the people that I just met along the way. Uh, Margo was there. Uh, Harold Stolovich, I mean, you know, I met Harold Stolovich. I brought him in to do some work for us. Uh, Erica, certainly. If you bring in Harold, you bring in Erica. So they're a package. Uh, Danny Langdon and Kathleen Whiteside were around. So, I mean, they were there. Um, another person that a lot of people don't know, and they probably should because he's quite great in his field, I think, is Paul Harmon. And Paul yes. Harmon runs uh, EP Trends, which I, Carol Hagen and I do writing for BP Trends too right now. But, uh, uh, you know, Paul is, was one, of, he's one of the great people in the area of basically business processes. Mm -hmm. And he, well, and he and worked at Praxis he, back in the early days, too. He worked for, he worked for practice. Hummer. He works for practice. He also worked for Don Tosti. So, I mean, there's all these connections, connections, connections along the way of, um, of, of people. So, I, I just think it's an, inter an interesting experience along the way as we go forward uh, on this. Uh, so, I mean, so, so those are the people that I learned, again, I learned a lot from. I still, I still have to keep in contact with all these people, too, because I think it's important that yeah. we, we do that. Well, let me so, shift gears here just a little bit. Um, uh, what I, my next question is, what, what were your biggest influences? And what I'm looking for is, you know, people, articles, or books. And you've named a lot of people. But this is to help people that are interested in performance improvement. Mm -hmm evidence-based practices. Right. And so I'm looking for not the things that are basically new because you're a well-practiced practitioner and very experienced, but for the new people coming in, what would you point them to um, as, as things that they can pursue to begin to climb the learning curve here in this profession? Well, I was gonna say, the wall over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not is, is my is my is my library. Right. And I still use it, you know, every day. And so if I just look around uh, books that I have on the shelf, I certainly have my collection of Bob Mager books. Yes. And, uh, and Bob Mager books are really, you know, they're really good, simple. He's a great writer. It's a good way to see how this whole thing is laid out. So, I mean, certainly, so my Bob Mager books. Then next to that, I have my uh, Geary Rummler books. And uh, if from the first one of performance improvement to his latest ones. And uh, by the way, which, uh, he, he wrote um, a book called A Serious Performance Consulting, which I think is quite good. And, which, and he asked me to do the introduction to it, which I was honored to be able to do the introduction. And meanwhile, I said, well, if I'm gonna do the introduction to your book, will you do the introduction to my book? Or to the book that Carol Hagen, uh, Lynn Curry, and I wrote, so he yes. was kind of do that as well. So, so, I mean, I've got those. I have Roger Kaufman books uh, over here. I just looked at it as I'm looking at the shelf over here. I have um, a book called um, Figuring Things Out. Allison. Uh, another, another good one. So, I mean, I think if you just start looking at some of the early work by Nick, also the great book that you can't find anymore is that Joe Harless book. Accounts of analysis. Yes, um, I have that copy, and people keep saying, "Would you, would you lend it out?" And I say, "No, <laughs> right. I, I will not lend that book out." But I, those are the ones I, you know, I, that I keep on my shelf. But I'm saying is that read Gary's book, uh, Serious Performance Consulting. Uh, you know, a little bit because it's, it's it's nice case study. And by the way, that was an interesting one too. We were at a meeting, uh, one of the institutes, and I said. Gary, you've got such great stories, uh, and it'd be great to have you could write uh, something about, you know, I could follow your thinking. And so that's sort of, I remember when he's talking about it, and a friend of mine, too, uh, Mark Johnson, was sitting there, too, and Mark did a lot of his graphics for him. And so Mark, so he started thinking about how I could tell this story. And so if you look at his book, you've got his little boxes. Yeah. Which, are, which is his thinking along the way, which I just thought, I just thought it was very clever. I mean, yeah, that's, that, was, that was a good book. Uh, tell us the name of your book that you wrote with uh, Lynn and Carol. It's called Performance Architecture. 
and tell us a little bit about that book. Well, okay, I was I was I was over at my friend Paul Herman's house, and Paul knows I like to travel. And Paul said, "I got these great travel books uh, that are laid out a little differently." So I looked at them. I said, "I just love them." So I looked at the back of the book and I said, "Well, these guys who do these are right here in San Francisco," and his name was Mark Johnson, which I just mentioned to you before. So I went, so I called Mark up and he said, okay, I'll come down and see me. So he was, I went down to see him and I just, I just, it was like a person who I'd known forever. I mean, he just worked out perfectly. And he's an architect. Uh, and his, one of his, his partner, original partner was Richard Saul Warman also. So uh, he's the guy who started the, the TED Talks. Ah. Yeah. So, and so they basically based all their information on information mapping mm -hmm. or information, you know, and, but, they, but they didn't know each other. Bob Horn didn't know each other either. Oh. But I mean, so it's a matter of that. They, they, it was just another one of those kinds of things. So I've introduced Bob Horn's work to Mark. And, and by the way, Mark and Carol and I are writing an article right now on forensics um, analysis. And so that'll be coming out soon uh, through BP trend, BPT Trends. So mm -hmm. like, yeah, we, we all sort of keep working together over and over again on things. Well, that's what happened. He, by, by, he was the architect. Effort. Yeah, he was the architect. And I was the performance guy. So performance architecture came out that way. Well, thank you. Um, let me shift gears here again a little bit. Uh, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech. So again, this is to provide an example to other people and I'm not gonna time you, so don't worry about that. But if you were to give us a 30 second or so elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? You know, I, I've, I thought about that and what, you know, it's a, my 30 second would be, I improve performance of people, worker, the work they do and the, where in the workplace they do it in and what i try to do is impact society in some way or the the world so those were the w's um and then again i've been you know roger kaufman and i've been talking about it a while now i said we probably reverse that we should probably start with world impact first and work backwards so how do you you know what are you going to do to have world impact what environment do you have to set up to have a world impact? so what kind of processes do you have to have? And then what are the people you have to have to do that? So I think that's my thinking right now. I, I like that. I like the, the flipping of that from the individual performance to looking at it more systemically, systematically, right. from, from, you know, what's, what's good for the world. Which that's what I learned from, that's what I learned from uh, Lloyd Homme. Well, Lloyd Homme, when I, was, uh, when I was like 20 years old, I, I had come up with an idea called uh, reinforcing event menu. And he said, well, let's do an article together. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> I kept saying, okay. So we actually published in ISPI uh, an article called reinforcing event menu. And he, I, and I thought he was going to be the primary author. And he says, no, no, you, it's your idea. You're the author. So that was my first article that I, that we wrote, I wrote together with somebody. And of course, that's available to members of ISPI through the Wiley Connection. Can they go okay. and get that? Those early, 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 early journals? Right, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's been digitized, I believe. Yeah, yeah it has been, yes. So let's uh, again shift again slightly here. So what's your current focus or next focus for learning? As a lifelong learner, what are you pursuing learning-wise? And then will segue into, you know, what, what are you currently writing about or what are your future intentions for writing? Well, there, I, started, I started working, I'm uh, going back to the institutes. Uh, there was a guy that I met along the way. His name was Klaus Witkin. Mm -hmm. And Klaus was, a, he's a past president of ISPI also. And Klaus, uh, I said, you know, I, I want to get some international people working in this institute. And he's from Germany. I said, oh, Okay, that all works out fine. And I had done some work, uh, some of the work my workshop he had done in Germany, so I met him. So uh, I introduced Klaus to uh, Gary Rumler, and they basically just hit it off immediately. 
and they they worked a long time together and, and uh, actually he was became one of the partners uh, so one of the things the reason why I mentioned that is because I still learn a lot from Klaus Klaus I think is one of the best thinkers in our field right now uh, he comes always with great ideas so I've had an opportunity to work with him uh, we just finished a series for USAID uh, that uh, I think was interesting to work with him. We, I, I worked with some of the models he's come up with. I've used some of the models he's come up with. He's incorporated some of my models in his work. So that's where I keep learning right now from that. And then again, you know, I always liked, uh, you know, you know, Margot Murray, I know you had on last week, you know, one of Margot's, he talks about Margot's maxims, yes. telling it, pass it on. And so, I mean, I think that's the whole idea of, uh, how I learn is by people passing it on to me, then I hope that I can pass it on to people as well. So I, I think that's, that's what I'm learning. That's what I keep learning. Thank you. So this next thing, we talked about this just, uh, just before we hit the record button, but is, is there a favorite performance or perhaps it's less of a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to discuss or define for us? And I usually set this up saying, you know, perhaps you think that it's uh, uh, being misused or misconstrued. Um, but anyway, so what have you got for us here? What's, what's a term? Well, for I think if you go back to word, human performance technology. So again, I know it's all people. So that's, I don't have a problem with working with people. But human performance technology is, the human part is, there are the people who do work processes in some type of work environment. So just to talk about in a vacuum, talking about people, and Gary Rummer would always say, people are not in a vacuum. They do things and they in an environment. So to me, the H is all that. It's just not one piece of it. Um, so that, so that, that's always been, again, go back to using where the International Society for Performance Improvement not HPT, but that's that's the H to me in performance improvement. And then along comes, uh, you know, uh, Roger Kaufman and says, you know, we've got mega. And so isn't that part of it too? And I said, you know, to me, it's part of it. So that's the 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 H. The H is big. Yeah. Uh, I do, as we talked about before we started the video here, it was, uh, we discussed back in 2003 and four in a big presidential initiative on clarifying HPT, right. the discussion was revolved at one point around the name, right. this collection of stuff. And Danny Langdon had been for years talking about get the H out, which is a cute yeah. way of saying it. Um, but it was your brother, Don Toasty, who shut the entire conversation down by saying he liked HPT. He liked the word human being in it because all performance is a human endeavor. Now, maybe that needs to be revisited. Well, you know, it, in 2009, it, in, in one of these videos, in the 2009 version of Tiagi's video with me, he said, HPT, well, we used to call it performance improvement. <laughs> so yeah, we, <laughs> well, we just don't know what to settle on, I guess. Like I say, I mean, if you look at some of the work that in artificial intelligence, maybe it's not always people in that sense. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting away from some of those kinds of thinking. So, and performance was, you know, certainly, you know, it's the, the process, 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 people, people doing something, something, something. But the word technology, and I've always loved the word technology, because I think it's an interesting, I, I like the word, because if you look it up, it's applied science. Yes. And that's what we, we that's what we do. We try to apply science. So, the word technology that sort of people think about it being the machinery involved, you know, that's like maybe yeah. the third or fourth defin or definition of the word technology. But if you're talking about applied science, that's yeah, but, how that, I but, but as somebody pointed out back then in 2003 or four, that that would make us the pits. <laughs> Performance improvement technology didn't work. So, that, <laughs> so at least we thought that one through and didn't but, go that route, but. I know. But in, anyway, I still I still like the idea of performance improvement. Yeah, and you know that certainly covers all the things that that I think one has to look at when you're trying mm -hmm. to, to improve performance. 
Well, I'm sure it's not going to be settled anytime soon. Um, well, but uh, but it's yeah, that's the IP, ISBI changed their name to the International Society for um, HPT. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But no, I don't either. Um, but anyway, so thank you for uh, uh, voicing your perspective on the label. At least, uh, what always annoyed me is that we always called everything from NSPI and ISPI to be instruction or non-instruction. And the whole need to clarify what the heck is in non-instruction, uh, you and I were talking just before we the record button again about, uh, about some of this. And, you know, when Motorola uh, created Six Sigma, they licensed Gary Rundler's intellectual property. His work is at the heart of that. And as I've made, as I remarked to people, if you looked at what his work was that he was doing at Motorola at the time, and he was also working at GE, which is how that GE became an even bigger sponsor of Six Sigma uh, than Motorola did. Um, but he was doing what, what I think many would con uh, uh, concede is really lean. So he was doing lean. He influenced Six Sigma. He came from a, um, a programmed instruction and instructional starting point. Um, and at one time he told me that he, he, you know, that instruction wasn't working. And as he and many others at the time, back in the 60s, started to look at, well, there's all these other variables and they all kind of went their own way. Um, some went, you know, to try to, be at the lead of an educational revolution. And I don't think he went in the educational direction, but he went to look at all the other variables. Um, right. um, but uh, so, so my next, this kind of is a segue into the next question, which is exploring some of the people who influenced you regarding your early practice. And we, we've talked about many of these things and I wanted to give you another opportunity to, you know, reference some of the people from the past um, so we might help newcomers to the discipline and point them at you know people who had something of value to contribute they were influential to you and perhaps others should follow up and begin to look at some of their work well you know i, I mentioned a lot of people along the way and there's some people who certainly i i, I still keep their books and their information close at hand you know allison rossett's book on job aids. You know, if you don't have that uh, in your library, then get it. So, I mean, some of these things that are just to build your library of, of people who are really good thinkers in our field. So, I think her work in job aids have been very, very helpful. Although, you know, but if you, if you don't, have, if you never had an opportunity to take the original job aid workshop, which was heartless, <laughs> right? But most people, many people didn't, that stuff is gone. The only place I really have it is, you know, for, although I have my, I have my book back here, <laughs> but I mean, but most of that thing is, doesn't exist. And so you have to do is, you know, see who has sort of taken on those mantles today yeah. and, and can do it. But I mean, I think her work, I think uh, uh, Judy Hale's work and uh, uh, as always, you know, I have uh, all of her materials that are quite good. So if you really want somebody that has done a nice job in, in that. Um, I, I, don't, I, I mentioned figuring things out um, was another book that I had. And I misattributed that to, to Allison, but that was yeah, yeah. the guy from Training Magazine. Um, right, yeah. Oh, I'm blanking on his name right now, but yeah, that's a, that was a good book. That's a, uh, Ron Simke. Ron Simke. Ron Simke, yes, Ron Simke. So, I mean, that's another one, you, you know, if you, you can't, you got to go to an old bookstore and get it someplace, but if you don't have that in your library, I mean, that's another one that is really quite, quite good. So, uh, and then the Roger Kaufman books on uh, analysis, but he's got some of his later articles and things like I that. I wouldn't know where to start with his book. He's got 41 books. <laughs> well, I always, I always kid Roger too. I said, you've got 41 books, but some of them say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think some of his later writings I like I like his later writing. Mm -hmm. and I like his writing on the mega that are I think yeah. quite good. Yeah. So you and he just is your article published? You guys were working on an article a few months back. Is that come out yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was published. It was published. 
I think ISBI published it. Mm -hmm. Again, and as, as I'm, I now, I've got articles out there with, with Roger, uh, Carol Haig, and I do this quarterly meeting, a quarterly. So I keep with. We got all those articles that Carol Haig and I did. Um, Friend spotters, yes. Friend spotters. They're all on uh, the web, the Treasure website. So I, if you look back at it, you know there there was a, uh, there was over a hundred articles there. Yeah. And then Carol and I were just doing, Carol and I were just going back and looking at the articles that we did for BB Tree Trends, and there's been I think we've almost got fifty there. So we keep doing these things. You you Thank keep you. sharing. Thank keep you. Keep sharing. Doing all that. Well, Roger, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me. Our third video here, and it only took 12 years to get to the third one. Um, but do you have any parting words of wisdom, especially for new people coming into the field? But what would your recommendation, somebody's, somebody's interested in this, maybe they're in the uh, learning and development L&D world and they want to um, move to performance. What's your guidance for them? Well, you know, um... I, always, I think you've got, and I go back to Margot's um, work that you find yourself a mentor and, you know, and try to work with them. Now, one of the things that I also see is that if you, if you have a network of people you can ask, for example, Richard Dick Clark is one of my go-to people for research. So if you have a good network uh, of what you're trying to accomplish here, then I think that you can can expand your thinking around besides what training. I have no you know, I have no problem with training when it's the right solution. When you need the acquisition for skills and knowledge, but there are so many other things that one needs to be looking at to improve performance. And you don't have to be an expert. Remember the P and RSVP. You can partner and find those people you can partner with to help you out with solving some of these, these, uh, these, these big issues that we have. Well, again, thank you, Roger, so much for you know, sharing your insights and your stories with us uh, and mentioning all those, those people from the past who have been so influential uh, directly or indirectly to those of us who uh, tr you know, try to do this work. Thanks again so much. Thank you, it was fun.